the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will come to order and pursue it to Committee Rule 5B of House Rule 11 2H4. The Chair may postpone further proceedings today on any question of approving any measure of uh, or matter or adopting an amendment or which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered. And without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Our first item of, uh, for consideration is H.R. Uh, 2227, the Modernization uh, Government Technology Act of 2017. The clerk will designate the, the bill. H.R. 2227, to modernize government information technology and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for an amendment at any point and without objection so ordered. I now recognize the sponsor of the bill, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hurd, for five minutes to explain the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Each year, the federal government spends over $89 billion in taxpayer dollars on information technology, with nearly 75% of that directed just towards operating and maintaining existing IT systems. Couple this with innovation and management strategies that are decades behind the private sector when it comes to IT and the increasing cost of maintaining these aging and insecure systems, this is unsustainable. These systems pose increasing operational security risk for the federal government, as we saw with the devastating OPM data breach, which impacted over 20 million people. The American government deserved better from their government, especially on an issue that is completely solvable. Our government needs to be able to introduce cutting-edge technology into their networks to improve operational efficiency and decrease operational costs. This bipartisan IT reform package is designed to reduce wasteful IT spending and strengthen information security by accelerating the federal government's transition to modern technology like cloud computing. This legislation is an innovative solution and a tremendous step forward in strengthening our digital infrastructure. Last year, this committee reported this bill to the whole House where it passed on a simple voice, voice vote. Unfortunately, we ran out of time on this bill last Congress with the Senate, but we have an opportunity to act this year with an improved bill. H.R. 2227 authorizes two types of funds to modernize legacy IT and incentivize IT savings in federal agencies. The bill authorizes funds within an individual CFO Act agencies and it authorizes a centralized fund locating with located within Treasury and overseen by OMB. These two funds will incentivize IT savings and reward cost-sensitive and responsible chief information officers. Under MGT, savings obtained by federal agencies by doing things like streamlining IT systems, replacing legacy products, and transitioning to cloud computing can be placed in a working capital fund that can be accessed for up to three years for further modernization efforts. This approach eliminates the traditional use it or lose it approach that has plagued government technology for decades. This bill also limits appropriations for the central fund to $250 million per year for fiscal years 2018 and 2019. This approach to government investments will transform government technology by keeping our information and digital infrastructure secure from cyber attacks while saving billions of taxpayer dollars. I appreciate the bipartisan support and leadership on this issue from Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Cummings, my Ranking Member and friend, Ms. Kelly, Mr. Connolly, Majority Leader McCarthy, and Minority Whip Steny Hoyer, along with others. I also want to thank Reps Demings, Farenthold, and ISA for the support of this bill. Before I close, Mr. Chairman, I also ask a seek unanimous consent to include nine industry letters, leader letters of support for this record, leaders, uh, letters from folks like the IT Alliance for Public Sector and, and Professional Services Council. Without objection. Thank you, sir. And I urge my colleagues to support this measure, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from Texas. The chair recognizes uh, my good friend, the gentleman from Virginia, uh, Mr. Conley. I thank the chair, uh, and I thank Mr. Hurd for his leadership on this bill. As the ranking member of Government Ops Subcommittee, and co-author of FATAR, the Federal Information Technology Acquisition Reform Act with Mr. Issa. I'm particularly proud uh, to be the Democratic lead on the Modernize Modernizing Government Technology Act, H.R. 2227, along with Mr. Hurd and our friend, Representative Kelly. This bipartisan bicameral legislation would reduce agency spending on maintaining legacy IT systems and enhance information security by allowing agencies to use their own savings 
to accelerate the federal government's transition to cloud computing. Every day, Mr. Chairman, federal agencies endure cyber attacks that have the potential to endanger national security, even in unlikely agencies. This committee has had a hearing, you will recall, Mr. Chairman, for example, in the Department of Education that holds data on 40 million Americans. We don't think of that as a national security risk, but they have lots of financial data on lots of Americans, and their systems are potentially vulnerable. While the federal government does its best to protect their critical computer networks, its efforts are all too often stymied by outdated legacy information technology. Agencies spend 75 percent of their IT budgets simply trying to maintain these outdated systems and fall further and further behind in their ability to protect against constantly changing digital threats. During the implementation of FITARA, the Oversight Committee noticed this problem was created in part by the fact that agencies have very little incentive to retire legacy systems quickly. They might want to do it, but when they look at their budget priorities, this isn't one of them. In order to fully realize potential savings and move agencies to modernize, we need to add a little sugar to the tea. The MGT Act, uh, of which I was the lead co-sponsor and which passed the House, as Mr. Hurd just indicated, in the 114th Congress, marries two bills, the IT Modernization Act, of 2016 and the Modernizing Outdated and Vulnerable Equipment and Information Technology Act, H.R. 5792, or Move It. I was glad, along with my colleagues, to be on the ground floor for both of these bills and was an original co-sponsor for Steny Hoyer's IT Modernization Act, which created a revolving fund. I was also an original co-sponsor of the Move It Act, which revived the proposal first discussed during the drafting and amending of FITAR. The MGT Act allows agencies to create working capital funds that can be funded through approved reprogramming or transfers of other IT dollars or from savings realized under the FITARA implementation. These two bills uh, are different but complementary and worked to ultimately join the two to create the MGT Act, which is a welcome outgrowth of the efforts we began uh, with FITARA. The MGT Act will build on the success of ATAR by making available to federal agencies multiple IT modernization funding options. The MGT Act will authorize a significant upfront investment to retire vulnerable, large-scale legacy systems, some of which was, we know go back a half a century at the IRS, for example. Um, so this is an important piece of good government. And it's a good example of how we can come together on a bipartisan basis when we're willing to work together and sometimes put aside our egos and our politics for the sake of creating good. Uh, and uh, this is our committee at its best. And I thank my friend, Mr. Hurd. I thank uh, Robin Kelly from Illinois for their leadership on the IT subcommittee. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your leadership and your cooperation on our subcommittee, Government Ops. The four of us, I think, have along with Chairman Chaffetz and Mr. Issa, who's not here, um, have really uh, formed a bipartisan team. There's no light among us or between us, uh, and I think that is very good uh, uh, as we move forward to try to modernize the government and bring it into the 21st century from a technological point of view. It's going to be good for our citizens, uh, and it's going to be good for the agencies affected. With that, I yield back. Well, I think the gentleman's um insightful words, his kind remarks, and really his leadership and the humility of which he leads. And any opening statement that talks about adding sugar to tea <laughs> is welcomed, uh, you know, in, uh, from North Carolina. But is there any other uh, member who would like to speak on the bill? Uh, seeing none, we're now ready to start the amendment process. Are there any amendments to the bill? If none, the question is now on the adoption and favorably reporting H.R. 2227 to the House of Representatives. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported. As previously, in, um, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Our next item for consideration is H.R. 2196 uh, to amend Title V of the United States Code to allow whistleblowers to disclose information to certain recipients. Uh, the clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 2196 to amend Title V of the United States Code to allow whistleblowers to disclose information to certain recipients. 
I ask unanimous consent that the bill be read and open for, uh, as uh, be considered as read and open for amendments at any point. Without objection, it is so so ordered. I now recognize the sponsor of the bill, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Russell, for five minutes to explain the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 2196 is fundamentally a bill to ensure the protection of classified information by empowering whistleblowers and others within their chain to protect state secrets while reforming waste and wrongdoing. The classification process ensures that the most sensitive secrets of our nation are protected against disclosure. The very definition of classified information is information that could harm the country if it were made public. However, that does not mean that there can be waste, fraud, and abuse surrounding the classified programs. In fact, secrecy sometimes allows problems to thrive by choking accountability. One wrong-headed supervisor can stymie those protecting our nation simply by leveraging existing reporting rules. It's imperative that we make it as easy as possible for federal employees to report problems through protected channels. Throughout the government, the most common avenue for reporting issues is through the chain of command. And Mr. Chairman, one thing that I learned in my decades of military service is that leaders and supervisors are usually in the best position to address issues that arise under their stewardship. This especially makes sense when it comes to classified information. Using the chain of command to report problems also ensures sensitive information is not unnecessarily shared with outside sources if it does not have to be. These are precisely some of the reasons why reporting through the chain of command is one of the most central tenets of our military. It is also why we incentivize reporting through the chain of command wherever possible for the rest of the federal government. However, since it is also the most common channel for reporting problems in the civilian workforce, it is arguably the most important to shield against retaliation. In a perfect world, supervisors who have problems brought to their attention would take steps to fix those problems. They would even thank the messenger for their role. But when they don't, we should protect the well-intentioned employees who are just trying to do the right thing by our republic. In recent years, a consensus has emerged that protecting disclosures to supervisors is a key part of finding and fixing problems in the federal civilian workforce. Non-classified disclosures to supervisors in the civilian workforce have been protected since 1978. In the intelligence community, disclosures to supervisors have been protected since 2012. Last Congress, we adopted the, this committee's legislation to protect disclosures to supervisors at the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which has different procedures than the rest of government. I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Cummings and Representative Lynch uh, for their bipartisan support as co-sponsors of H.R. 2196. This bill will extend these protections for unlawful, for lawful, rather, classified disclosures to non-intelligence community employees. In addition to protecting disclosures to supervisors in an employee's chain of command, it also protects disclosures to the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community and the Director of the National Intelligence. Again, these are precisely the types of places we want federal employees to go with classified information. It is time we protect one of the most common means of identifying problems that involve the most sensitive information this nation has. And I ask my colleagues to support this bill and take another important step to protecting our state secrets that are under constant attack. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield to any questions. I thank the, the gentleman, Mr. Russell, for uh, his uh, leadership on this particular issue. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for any statement on the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Are these my son? Yeah, I think they're working on it. Um, I'm pleased to be, uh, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Russell for his very hard work on this uh, very important bill. Uh, and I'm also very pleased to be an original co-sponsor. Uh, this bill would provide important protections to whistleblowers who handle classified information and want to report waste, fraud, or abuse. Under this bill, employees covered by the Whistleblower Protection Act could disclose to any supervisors in their direct chain of command classified information the employees reasonably believe shows wrongdoing. Under the Whistleblower Protection Act, if a whistleblower discloses classified information, 
the whistleblower is protected only if they make their disclosures to the Office of Special Counsel and Inspector General, the head of the whistleblower's agency, or an employee designated by the head of the agency. It is critical that we encourage employees who handle classified information to blow the whistle on waste, fraud, and abuse. Allowing employees to go to other supervisors with evidence of wrongdoing may be less intimidating than going to the agency head or an IG. Uh, this bill is modeled on language in a presidential policy directive issued in 2012. The director, the, the director PPD 19, provided whistleblower protections to intelligence community employees who are not covered by the Whistleblower Protection Act. The House passed version of the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act included a provision that is similar to the bill we are considering today. This is an important bill, and I look forward to working with Mr. Russell and other members of the committee to get it to the President's desk. And before I go on, Mr. Chairman, I must tell you, this reminded me of days when I used to turn off my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I would never but, but I know it was Mr. Russell I, went out too so I, I feel it was a bipartisan kind of thing well I would ne <laughs> I would never cut off your mic there the gentleman from Maryland so uh, uh, there are times when I know you wish to mute, to, uh, mute me though I, uh, so uh, I, are there any other uh, members wishing to speak or shout on the bill <laughs> Mr. Chairman uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, is recognized. Is it on? I just want to thank and congratulate Mr. Russell for his leadership. He's identified a gap in whistleblower protection. This committee has a strong, strong record on a bipartisan basis, irrespective of who's in the White House. Uh, to protect whistleblowers. Uh, they are important to the functioning of government. And so I thank our colleague for identifying this and look forward to voting for his bill. Seeing none, if none, the question is now on the adoption and favorably reporting H.R. 2196 to the House of Representatives. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Our next item for consideration is H.R. 2195, the OSC Access Act. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 2195 to amend Title V United States Code to provide for access of the special counsel to certain information. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point, at any point without objection so ordered. It is my understanding that the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Blum, will offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute to this bill. Without objection, we will call up the amendment in the nature of a substitute, and then I'll recognize Mr. Blum uh, for a statement on both uh, the amendment in the nature of substitute and the underlying bill. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2195 offered by Mr. Blum of Iowa. I now recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Blum, for five minutes for a statement on the legislation and the amendment in the nature of substitute. Is this working now? No? Is it working? Oh. We recently observed the 28th anniversary of the Whistleblower Protection Act becoming law. Signed into law on April 10, 1989, this watershed legislation strengthened whistleblower protections and established the Office of Special Counsel as an independent agency. OSC had previously been an arm of the Merit Systems Protection Board when both were created by the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978. As an independent agency, OSC had the primary responsibility to, quote, receive and investigate allegations of prohibited personnel practices, end quote, 
as well as violations of the Hatch Act of 1939. To carry out that responsibility, Congress gave OSC authority to administer oaths, examine witnesses, take depositions, and receive evidence with the power to issue subpoenas to enforce that authority. Congress clearly intended that OSC have the access it needed to figure out whether adverse personnel actions were taken for prohibited reasons, such as retaliation against whistleblowers. Since 1989, OSC has carried out the responsibilities assigned by Congress. OSC plays the primary role of protecting those who blow the whistle on waste, fraud, and abuse. Agencies should thank OSC for helping to root out managers who retaliate against whistleblowers. Often, such managers, managers are the very employees who are engaged in the waste, fraud, and abuse. However, OSC's work is not always popular with the agencies whose employees it is tasked to investigate. My friend and colleague from Iowa, Senator Chuck Grassley, has often said that whistleblowers are frequently treated like a skunk at a picnic. Sometimes OSC is treated that way too, simply for standing up for those whistleblowers. Occasionally, agencies have asserted attorney-client privilege over documents requested by OSC, even though OSC is also part of the executive branch. Federal agencies send precisely the wrong message with this kind of thinking. They exist to serve the American taxpayer, and Congress created OSC to help them do exactly that. Besides, communications from agencies' attorneys are sometimes precisely the documents needed to prove or disprove retaliation. Last year, we introduced a bill to reauthorize OSC, which included a provision clarifying OSC's right of access to documents. The House passed the bipartisan bill by vo voice vote on June 21, 2016. Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee Chairman Senator Ron Johnson also included an access provision in an OSC reauthorization bill he drafted last year. However, with the limited legislative calendar last year, his committee was unable to mark up the bill before the end of Congress. The House has again passed the bill this Congress, and the Senate is on track to pass theirs as well. Unfortunately, the failure to sign these important provisions into law last year emboldened some agencies in obstructing OSC. For example, TSA attorneys told OSC that since the access bills did not pass Congress last year, it was proof Congress did not think OSC was entitled to access. The OSC Access Act is intended to settle this once and for all. It will make clear OSC's right to access all the materials it needs in the course of an investigation. It is unfortunate, unfortunate that we have to go to these lengths just to clarify what should have already been clear. My colleague Senator Grassley and others put immense thought into authoring the Whistleblower Protection Act of 1989 for they knew whistleblowers were patriotic individuals who play key roles in our government. Congress adopted that law to protect these individuals. Now this legislation is key to ensuring that we are able to continue with that important mission. I strongly urge my colleagues to support this very important legislation. And I also like to recognize, Mr. Chairman, the great job that Carolyn Lerner is doing, and I urge the President to uh, reappoint her to her position and I'd also like to recognize, Mr. Chairman, the five co-chairs of the Whistleblower Caucus who have all, all support this amendment, uh, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Cummings, Kathleen Rice, Jackie Spear, and Mike Kaufman. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from uh, Iowa for his comments. I might remind all members that actually uh, C-SPAN uh, and uh, the court uh, stenographer can actually hear the mic even though we can't hear it here. And so if you would turn on your mics, the chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for any statement on the bill and the amendment and the nature of a substitute. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be a co-sponsor of OSC uh, Act. Access Act. The bill uh, includes language similar to a bill the House already passed earlier this year to reauthorize uh, the Office of Special Counsel. The larger bill includes a host of provisions, but this bill sim simply clarifies that OSC has the right to obtain information from other agencies to conduct its work. The committee is considering this bill because the Department of Homeland Security has instituted a policy of withholding information from OSC. The Transportation Security Agency has been using this policy as an excuse 
to withhold from OSC and any uh, agency communication that includes an agency attorney. Special Counsel Carolyn Lerner testified before the committee on March 2nd, 2017, and I quote, no court has ever held the attorney-client privilege can be asserted during intragovernmental administrative investigations. She also testified, quote, OSC must review the communications between management officials and agency counsel to determine whether an agency acted with a legitimate or unlawful uh, uh, basis in taking action against a whistleblower. It's important that uh, this committee pass this bill and send a clear signal that we support OSC and its work. No agency is above the law. No agency has the right to withhold information from OSC and it needs to investigate claims of, uh, of, of whistleblower retaliation. This bill is being considered with an amendment to make changes requested by the Inspector General for HHS. Those changes would ensure that documents protected by court order or under seal in a false claims act case would uh, continue to be uh, protected. Uh, again, this is an uh, exemplar of bipartisan work. Uh, the committee ought to be applauded. Thank the sponsor, co-sponsors, and with that, I yield back. I, th I thank the gentleman. Does any other member wish to speak on the bill or the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Uh, the chair recognizes himself for uh, a few comments. Uh, I, I want to thank the gentleman, Mr. Blum, for his leadership and the bipartisan way, as a ranking member, Mr. Cummings so eloquently put it, uh, in how we are, are addressing this particular issue. It's also another uh, example of where we have an issue that is highlighted in a hearing. And then there is legislation that comes uh, really as a result of that hearing to address that particular uh, issue. So I, I thank uh, everyone involved in this bill. We're now ready to start the amendment process. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? If not, the question is now on the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Blum. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. The question is now on the adoption and favorably uh, reporting H.R. 2195 as amended, uh, as amended to the House of Representatives. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, in the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the bill is ordered favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Our next item for consideration is H.R. 2229, the All-Circuit Review Act. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 2229, to amend Title V United States Code to provide permanent authority for judicial review of certain Merit Systems Protection Board decisions related to whistleblowers and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the bill will be considered as read and open for an amendment at any point without objection. It is so ordered. I uh, now recognize the sponsor of the bill, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes to explain the legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I introduce the All Circuit uh, Review Act to make permanent a pilot provision in the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. This provision gives federal whistleblowers the right to file appeals in the jurisdictions where they work or where they live. I want to thank Representative Fernholm for co-sponsoring this bill and working with me to advance it. Representative Fernholm also co-sponsored the bill I introduced in the 113th Congress that extended this all-circuit review authority for an additional three years, the All-Circuit Review Extension Act. President Obama signed uh, that law, that bill into law in 2014 after it sailed through Congress with a unanimous support. The bill we are considering today would make that all-circuit review provision permanent. Otherwise, it will expire in November of this year. Without this provision, whistleblowers could not appeal a decision of the Merit Systems Protection Board 
to any court except the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit has historically been overly restrictive of whistleblower rights. According to the MSPB, since the all-circuit review provision has been in place, 29 cases have been appealed to courts other than the Federal Circuit. Finally, I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to place into the record a letter of support from the Project on Government Oversight, which states, and I quote, the pilot program has been a success. It has not resulted in a flood of whistleblower appeals as opponents of the program asserted it would do, and it allows for potential circuit splits, uh, which encourage sister circuits to review the laws and allows for possible Supreme Court review. It is working exactly as intended and should be made permanent before it expires in November 2017, end of quote. Unanimous consent to the Without report. objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now, this is an important due process right for whistleblowers, and I urge the committee to approve this bill. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The, the chair now recognizes himself for a statement on the bill. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's rare in this town many times where you actually have uh, leadership that demands bipartisan support and addresses something that is such a critical need. And so uh, it is with great pleasure that the, the chair recognizes the leadership of the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, who has uh, not only uh, seen this as an issue that needed to be addressed, but also saw the merits of a pilot program that allowed for whistleblowers to really ap appeal to uh, the Merit Systems Protection Board. Uh, previously, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit had a monopoly on these cases, and, uh, and so historically they've ruled against whistleblowers in almost every single case uh, in an, uh, an attempt to make sure that not only whistleblowers are protected, but ultimately the information that they bring forth is used in a meaningful way to make sure that our government is held accountable. We agree on a bipartisan basis that there is not only a critical need to protect whistleblowers, but also to make sure that they, uh, uh, we go beyond that protection in a, in a way that not only gives them a comfort to come forward, but lets them know that we will have their back. I've heard the ranking member and the chairman of the full committee and myself many times um, directly appeal to those whistleblowers that uh, the full protection uh, afforded them will not be uh, yielded. And so it is uh, with great uh, uh, joy that I uh, certainly not only support this legislation, but look at taking a pilot program that was part of the uh, the 2012 Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act that's going to expire this November without action from Congress uh, and actually move this forward and making sure that we do not uh, clog our court systems. Uh, this one has not. Uh, this bill uh, comes at a very low court, uh, cost to the court system with, but has a high reward to whistleblowers and those of us who care about that protection. So I express my support for this legislation. I thank the ranking member for his efforts on this issue, and I encourage all my colleagues to support it as well. Is there any other member wishing to speak? The, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I think this is a very, <clears throat> very good bill, and this committee ought to uh, given its long experience, very bipartisan experience with whistleblower uh, legislation and with the results we have seen by looking to the very special expertise of the Federal Circuit ought to understand why this is such a good bill and before it expires to make sure uh, that its jurisdiction is spread to every uh, circuit. Members of this committee may have been um, befuddled, as I have been, by the uh, failure of whistleblowers to get remedies uh, in the federal circuit, no matter what this committee does. I hasten to add that we're not passing this bill in order 
uh, to get a change in how the courts, in fact, come out. Uh, if, if there is any incentive for this bill, it is con considering where whistleblowers are and where they work. They're not all in Washington. They're not all near the federal circuit. And we don't have, uh, when matters go only to the federal circuit, we don't have the understanding of a piece of legislation that we have when they go to all circuits. So I think that the fact that we've tried out the federal circuit, that we've seen uh, decisions from the federal circuit that often seem to be at odds with the intent of Congress, that the time has come to do what we do with most legislation of this kind, and that is to say to all circuits, let everyone get in it, and between the circuits and among the circuits, this matter can get sorted out. So I strongly uh, support uh, this uh, legislation, which has such support uh, on both sides of the aisle, and I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the, the gentlewoman. Is there any other member wishing to speak on the bill? We're now ready to start the amendment process. Are there any amendments to the bill? If none, the question is now on the adoption and favorably reporting H.R. 2229 to the House of Representatives. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, as the ayes have it, the bill is favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Without objection, pursuant to Clause 2L of House Rule 11, members will have two days to submit views on the bills considered today. I ask unanimous consent uh, that the staff be allowed to make necessary technical and conforming changes to the bills ordered reported today, subject to the approval of the minority. Hearing no objection, so ordered. If there is no further business without objection, the committee stands adjourned.